As many of you know, the main killing element of the deadly D225G H1N1 mutation and the H5N1 bird flu isn't the virus itself. It's the human body's reaction to the virus that goes out of control. This is what's called a cytokine storm. I explained in a previous video the details of how and why this cytokine storm happens. Basically, the cytokines are the activators of your immunal response inside your body. And once they start going out of control, a feedback loop is created where the immune system attacks your body and the effect snowballs until the person is dead, which is usually very quick once the process is started. This feedback loop is much like a feedback loop involving a microphone, amplifier, and speaker. If the volume is turned up a little too loud, the feedback loop will occur and will become deafeningly loud. Think of the volume being turned up as analogous to a person with a very healthy immune system. Your cytokine production is very high and it enables this feedback loop to occur. This is why mostly young, healthy adults fall victim to the cytokine storm effect. Older, sickly people who die from H1N1 tend to die from secondary infections because their immune system is weaker, which stops the cytokine storm from occurring, but also leaves them vulnerable to bacteria that causes pneumonia. So the real question is, what can we do to be proactive about this issue? What can we do to protect ourselves? It was starting to seem like the vaccine might actually be worth the risks if it could protect us from the more deadly DT25G mutation. However, testing results have shown that the DT25G mutation is considered a low reactor, meaning that the immuno response to the virus after receiving the vaccine was diminished by fourfold or greater. This signals what is called a vaccine mismatch, meaning the vaccine won't work as well against the more deadly variant. Visit recombinomics.com for details on this. Furthermore, the adjuvants in vaccines are all immune system boosters. This is the reason why they're put into the vaccine, so that they don't have to use as much of the killed virus. They can instead cheat a little bit by boosting your immune system's response as the killed virus in the vaccine is introduced to your system. This gives the vaccine the same result while using less of the attenuated virus in the vaccine. The only problems with this procedure are that, first, Obviously, many people have horrible side effects to the adjuvants and can develop neurological and immune system diseases. But secondly, because these adjuvants are actually immune system boosters, if a virus is introduced to the host in which they are not immune, the probability of cytokine storm to occur is greatly increased. The volume on the speakers is turned up that much higher and the feedback loop has been enabled. Now, one medical news reporting organization that has actually had a track record of telling the world the truth is the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, known as SIDRAP. In my previous video, I showed how they informed the world in 2008 that there was a vaccine mismatch regarding the menial flu strain, the seasonal flu strain that was dominant for that season. After SIDRAP informed the world that there was a vaccine mismatch, they were slammed by colleagues and public health officials simply for telling the world the truth. A YouTube member linked me to another controversial SIDRAP article entitled, Original Antigenic Sin, a Threat to the H1N1 Vaccine Effectiveness, from August 18, 2009. The article says, Half a century ago, scientists reported evidence of some curious behavior by the immune system in humans and animals. If a host was exposed to an influenza virus and later encountered a variant strain of the same virus, the immune system responded to the second attack largely with the same weapons it used against the first one. Like an army still fighting by the tactics of the last war, the host immune system mostly produced antibodies matched to the first virus instead of the second, resulting in a less effective defense. With a nod to theology, this phenomenon was labeled original antigenic sin. So, as we know, a vaccine works by introducing the virus that it's protecting against into our system. The adjuvants help boost our immune system at that time in order to help develop what's called an immunologic memory. This means that our immune system will remember the virus the next time it comes. But what happens if that second virus that is introduced is the same type of virus, but different? Our immune system will wrongly assume that the virus is the exact same and treat it as such. The result is that our body can actually be more vulnerable than it would be if it wasn't previously vaccinated because the immunologic memory will trigger the incorrect response. Another analogy for this is like getting into a knife fight with someone one day and you win but let them live the fight another day. Then after your opponent is healed up, he challenges you to another knife fight. However, this time he brought a gun, well you still only brought your knife. I'm no doctor, but for these reasons it looks like taking the vaccine might be counterproductive, especially if it's only highly effective against a strain of H1N1 that's not so deadly. 
so what can we do? Is there any way to be proactive, or is isolation our only option? It seems like the only way to get to the root of the problem is to inhibit the cytokine production. Therefore, the feedback loop wouldn't have a high enough volume to occur. The only way to do this without a prescription is to consume natural cytokine inhibitors. I found an article that lists some of them. I posted a link to the article on the info box on the right of this video. The article says that the main cytokines that are culpable for causing the cytokine storms are TNF-alpha, IL-6, IFN-gamma, IP-10, and IFN-beta. The article says the chemical referred to as EGCG inhibits the production of TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-8. The best source for EGCG is green tea. Black tea is not without its merits either, though, as the theoflavins in black tea appear to reduce the levels of IL-1 and IL-6. Several compounds in garlic appear to inhibit cytokines as well. Agione particularly inhibits the production of TNF-alpha. Allicin inhibits IL-1, IL-8, and IP-10, while allin increases IL-1 and TNF-alpha. Crushing or chopping garlic causes allin to be converted to allicin, while cooking garlic decreases allicin. Therefore, for the purposes of reducing cytokines, it's better to crush garlic and eat it raw. Now, that might help protect you from a cytokine storm, but it's not going to win you any points with your significant other. Um, I would suggest crushing the garlic up and then stuffing it into a pill, like, um, you know, a little capsule, then swallowing it. That way your breath might not stink as bad. The article also says, Chronic garlic administration decreases myocardial TNF-alpha expression in rats. One study showed that garlic may increase IL-10, and another showed it increased IL-4 while reducing IFN-gamma. However, in humans, garlic powder extract has been shown to reduce IL-1 and TNF-alpha with no effect on IL-10. The ratio of allin and allicin may be important here as well. When mice infected with influenza were fed vitamin E, they had significantly lower levels of IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. A relatively good natural source of vitamin E is red palm oil, which has been shown to reduce TNF in humans. Also, ACE inhibitors might prove useful to stop a cytokine storm from occurring, as well as vitamin D3. I don't have time in this video to go over the whole article. I suggest you check it out for yourself, but be sure to fully research any of these options before you decide to administer them. This is a risky business and you're putting your life into your own hands, but for some people that's better than doing nothing. Now, there is another option, but it's relatively untested. Colloidal silver. Silver is known in the medical industry for being a natural antibiotic and is used in all sorts of applications because of the antibacterial properties. Common uses are wound dressings containing silver sulfadiazine, urinary catheters and endotracheal breathing tubes with high silver content, prosthetic bones, and artificial heart diodes. But, on the other hand, a virus is not a bacteria and our main goal is to fight a cytokine storm, so can colloidal silver still be effective? I found this report in a peer-reviewed medical journal. International Immunopharmacology, Volume 7, Issue 13, December 15, 2007. The report was done by South Korean doctors and is entitled, The Effects of Nanosilver on the Proliferation of Cytokine Expression by Peripheral Blood Mononuclear Cells. It states, Silver could prove to be a valuable alternative raw material for antibiotics and disinfectants as it is relatively free of adverse effects. This study was designed to investigate the effects of nanosilver on the production of cytokines by and on the proliferation and peripheral blood mononuclear cells known as PBMCs. In addition, we investigated the potential cytotoxic effect of nanosilver on PBMCs. At levels of over 15 parts per million, nanosilver was found to have a significant cytotoxic effect on PBMCs, and PHA-induced cytokine productions were significantly inhibited by nanosilver. Although nanosilver had a cytotoxic effect at high concentration, nanosilver modulated cytokine production in a concentration-dependent manner. These experimental data suggest that nanosilver could be used to treat immunologic and inflammatory diseases. So it looks like there might actually be some science behind this whole colloidal silver thing. It might be able to stop a cytokine storm from occurring and even before that it might actually be able to stop you from being infected with H1N1. So I decided to try out this whole thing for myself. Um, PDXSilverGuy.com was kind enough to send me one of these colloidal silver generators and you can find him on YouTube. His username is E3Me7 if you want to look up some testimonials. But all you have to do is 
plug these little silver sticks into the terminals and stick it in your glass of water and wait about 15 or 20 minutes so we'll check back on that in a minute so as you can see here on one of the wires it looks like there's some bubbles coming off and the other wire has like a kind of milky substance coming off of it and I guess that's the silver ions but I guess we're about done here so I'll give it a try Tastes a little metallic, if you wouldn't have believed that.